By working faithfully 8 hours a day, you may eventually get to be boss and work 12 hours a day. In the lead-up to the 2019 UK general election, the British Labour Party announced that it would reduce the standard working week to 32 hours, without loss of pay, within 10 years of winning office. They went on to suffer a massive defeat. It turns out that people in 2019 are just not that swayed by promises of working less hours. A recent report by British economic historian Robert Skidelsky titled How to Achieve Shorter Working Hours outlines the social and ethical motivations in reducing work hours, but it does highlight one important trend — average work hours have stopped falling. In the 1860s, people in Britain worked an average of 60 or more hours a week, but by the 1970s and 80s, this trend stopped, and work hours have remained stuck at just over 40 hours a week. This trend is true of most Western countries. It seems that in the last 30 or 40 years, we've decided that 40 hours of work a week is the ideal number, and we'll be damned if we let anybody change that. This is despite labour productivity, that is, output per hour worked, increasing at an average of almost 2% per year since the 1980s. Recent analysis by the New Economics Foundation shows that if work hours continue to decline as they had been pre-1980s, we should currently only be working an average of 34 hours a week, and by 2040, only 30 hours a week. But this trend has just gone by the wayside. Apparently, working less hours is just not on the agenda, even though we could easily do so from a productivity point of view. It should be noted, however, that 40 hours of work a week is just the average. Many people are working much longer than that. Recent news articles show that many millennials are overworked, and it's causing major problems in their lives. 13% of Australian workers are working 50 hours or more a week, creating many social issues in the process. By the time they reach 40, they're burnt out. The problem is, there is a myth being circulated in society regarding success and happiness. The myth goes something like this. If I just work a little bit harder, then I'll be more successful. If I'm more successful, then I'll be happier. But this is scientifically broken. Happiness researcher Sean Acor, who did a TEDx talk on the subject titled The Happy Secret to Better Work, commented on success and how our brains respond to it. He said, Every time your brain has a success, you just change the goalpost of what success looks like. If happiness is on the other side of success, your brain never gets there, and as a society, we've pushed happiness over the cognitive horizon. So basically, success never brings happiness, although I suppose politicians and big companies like us to believe that it will. It keeps us working in jobs that we don't like, doing unpaid overtime. Law firms in Australia are renowned for overworking their staff. Unfortunately, young lawyers believe they have to put in the extra hours in order to succeed. Some have even resorted to drug use in order to combat fatigue. Of course, senior partners continue to spin the myth by saying that graduates will be grateful for working unpaid hours. Pilots and other cabin crew are also being overworked. That's one job where I don't want people being overworked, especially when people's lives are on the line. Three pilots died earlier this year shipping goods for one of Amazon Air's contract airlines. They've had a history of overworking their pilots, just so Amazon can keep their promise of one-day shipping. It was an inevitable conclusion that eventually somebody would die because of it. Long hours are common in other industries as well, including mining, farming, construction, and medicine — all jobs where safety should be of the highest priority. You don't have to look very far in the news to see that many doctors are being overworked and underpaid, and some are dying because of it. Doctors have substantially higher rates of psychological distress, as well as increased risk of suicide. Junior doctors have described a toxic and intimidating culture in which trainees are pressured to fudge their their overtime hours. Some trainees said they were being essentially forced to perform up to 40 hours of overtime a fortnight. Those who refuse are stigmatised. Those who suffer mentally because of it are encouraged not to speak up. Even taking a sick day is stigmatised in some circles. I remember a time during my wife's pregnancy when we were at the local hospital waiting for the doctor to arrive in one of the treatment rooms. A tired, sweaty doctor came waltzing in with a chart in his hands. He started reading out some results, but I soon realised he was reading out somebody else's chart. 
I let him know, and then he immediately worked out that he was in the wrong room. He apologised profusely, explaining that he had been working for more than 24 hours. I don't know how common this is, but based on recent news, I presume it's very common. Research shows us that mental health starts to decline after 39 hours of work a week. After 48 hours, job performance begins to rapidly decrease, and depression and anxiety start to increase. Sleep quality declines, which is associated with increased long-term health risks such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. Working more than 10 hours a day increases your risk of workplace injury by 40%, while working 12 hours a day increases your risk by 100%. Longer working hours have also been shown to harm relationships, erode your job satisfaction, and increase your risk of suicidal thoughts. You've got to ask yourself, is it worth it? Lord Skidelsky's report shows us that the burden of work is a human-created one. With the advance of technology, that is, the replacement of human effort by machine effort, work hours, in theory, should fall. But this is not what we're seeing. Productivity growth does not cause hours of work to fall. It enables them to fall. Whether they fall or not depends on whether politicians and society allow it to happen. It's a social choice. There is no need for long working hours, but unfortunately, society has created the need. With falling wage growth, the erosion of collective bargaining and work conditions, rising wealth inequality and job insecurity, increased availability and levels of debt, and the constant pressure to be successful by owning more and more useless stuff, people are losing their ability to voluntarily reduce their work hours. Essentially, people work long hours because financially, they feel that they have to. This has led us to not only engage in overwork, but also convince ourselves that it is necessary to love our work above all else. In the report, Lord Skidelsky argues that reducing work hours is actually ethically desirable. His argument goes like this, People are generally happier when spending time doing things they like, rather than doing things they have to do to earn an income. Spending less time at work, and therefore having more free time, is good for material and spiritual well-being. Promoting happiness and well-being is ethically desirable, so it is ethically desirable to reduce the number of hours a person has to work. It's a worthy goal. However, most people in modern society don't have the ability to reduce their work hours. Society has been set up to punish those who don't work hard enough. You can't buy a house. You can't go to the best schools. You won't get the big promotion unless you put in unpaid overtime. Even those who do work hard are still punished by essentially being forced to get into massive debt in order to buy an overpriced house that will take them a lifetime to pay off. There's no doubt that this is a societal issue. The report found that in the past, reduced work hours came about from a combination of government policy and trade union intervention. The government's role was to maintain full employment. Between 1945 and 1975 in Britain, unemployment was less than 2%. Essentially, government created a situation in which labour was relatively scarce, which increased the ability of workers to negotiate their salaries. Trade unions were then in a position to secure better working conditions for their members and allow them to benefit from the gains in productivity. In short, shorter hours were the result of policy from the top and pressure from below. Lord Skidelsky commented, Since the 1980s, these levers for hours reduction have been broken. Government has abandoned full employment, and union power of the wages bargain has been weakened. As a result, hours of work have stopped falling, inequality has risen, and the gains from productivity growth have gone increasingly to employers. The same process is set to continue with automation. Unfortunately, until these things are fixed, we'll continue having years of wage stagnation, overworked employees, rising income inequality, and massive debt. Thanks to advances in technology and automation, productivity is increasing, but all the spoils are going to the wealthy. Sadly, we keep on voting in the same old people who like the status quo, and want to keep things exactly the way they are. So in answering the question posed in the title of this video, shorter working hours is a fantasy, until we decide as a society that it is not.